Today, John's going to be talking to the title Happiest Days of Your Life. And we're going to be looking at um, schooling within Gloucestershire. So we're going to look at the origins of schooling in the county. And John will also have a look at some of the many, many school records which we've got here in our collections. Um, I realise I haven't introduced John. Probably most of you know him by now, but if you don't, this is John Putley. He's one of our community heritage officers. And with that, I'll pass over to you, John. Brilliant. OK, thank you, Kate. Um, so hello, hello and welcome, everybody. Um, so this talk today is all about school records that we've got. We've got a nice selection of them. And so we will dive straight into it. Um, Background, large Victorian education, because that's when it really kicked off. Prior to about 1837, it was education was really mainly for the privileged people only. Rich children were taught at home, usually by a governess. And they were typically unmarried women, which is why female teachers are nearly always referred to as miss rather than missus. Um, at around age of eight to 11, although it did vary, boys might go to a public schools, but girls would always continue to be educated at home. And of course, public schools charge money to teach children and were too expensive for anyone really than gentry or wealthy industrialists. Um, for, for poor children, there was a chance of education. It came via charity schools, really. Um, and these schools were funded by gifts, often left in wills or endowments, which is income from investments. Um, charity schools would often buy clothes for the children who attended their school and blue coats were the normal one for this and because blue was technically taken as the, the colour of charity and local examples we have is the Crip School in Gloucester, Sir Thomas Rich's School in Gloucester and the Bisley Blue Coats to Gaul. So these were all charity funded schools. Um, the subjects generally taught reading, writing, arithmetic, your basic three R's and religious instruction. Some schools taught more than this, but that is your basic idea of what they were thinking was necessary and important for life. I'm um, having the will of a Thomas chap called Thomas Merritt of Tewkesbury, died in 1724. And it's the sort of thing that you might find that they would give, leave money to school. So you get the basic start, the preamble. I, Thomas Merritt of Tewkesbury in the county of Gloucester, being weak in body, but a perfect minded memory, do make and ordain this last will. And then he lists what he wants to do with his sort of memory and property. And yet this sort of sentence paragraph in the middle, which I've highlighted there with the little arrow, um, as to the rest, the residue of all and any personal and realist state I give and bequeath to my loving sisters Catherine Hartlebury and Barbara Light paying yearly 50 shillings per annum to the use of the charity school of Tewkesbury. So he's donating he has a fair sum of money in that time to help run this school and the idea is that the, the, the sisters there will actually administer this money and give it to the school and, and sort of help them run it. Um, you also get the endowments from land. So this is again, this is a, a, another will of Frances Hopton who lived in Cam. She's actually set up a charity do it and it's quite and quite a nice one so 1730 she gave the land called drake at farm with the rents and profits of it to build a good and substantial schoolroom. i like with it apartments for our master and mistress but look at it's only to instruct 10 poor boys and 10 poor girls that's all it really could afford to do the master was to teach the boys reading writing and drawing up accounts which is important because probably most of the boys would end up running farms that they were renting um, and the girls you know you're going to get reading knitting and sewing that's about it but they, they did get a salary the, the master and mistress nine pound a year and the mistress five pound um and the children the one stipulation with children all had to be living in the parish of cam and they would be taught up to the age of 14 then they were sort of like sent away from school to go back into the world and find their own way um voluntary schools they some of these schools are set up by voluntary subscription Local wealthy patrons might set them up. So the good example in Gloucestershire is the Great Badminton School, which was set up by the Duke of Beaufort. He ran it all, paid for everything. Um, but local people could also raise money to build a school and then they would pay an annual subscription to meet running costs. And we've got an example in Gloucestershire at New Number 7. There are others, just as the one I've picked out. Few organisations existed to help this, help people do this. Firstly, you had the National Society for Promoting the Education of the Poor in the Principles of the Established Church in England and Wales, aka the National Schools. And that's a really nice picture we have there of a, a watercolour painting of Yate National School. And if you do go to this school and have a look at it, it's next door to Yate Heritage Centre. It has not changed a jot. It looks exactly the same as that. So it's well worth a visit. 
So the second organisation was the British and Foreign School Society. These were known as British schools, and these were essentially the non-conformist sites. They were supported by evangelical and non-conformist Christians and based on non-sectarian principles. So there's a bit of a rivalry between these two school groups um, in terms of setting schools up and getting pupils in. And the picture there is a rather nice picture of the Ebley British School. And you see it's quite a substantial building, so it must have cost a fair bit of money to set up. Uh, other schools, school pence, most of these schools were set up and they charged a weekly fee, which is called school pence. Um, the rate varied enormously, but it's typically set at about threepence, about 57p for the first child a week. And then the reductions for other children of the same family. And this is a little a bit of instructions for the Bible school, which was set up around about 1872. At this time, your typical farm worker earned about 15 shillings a week, give or take, it's about 35, 34 quid today. So the school fees amounted to about 2% of the income, which, you know, it's not very high, but it's probably high enough for them. You know, we all know how much people get squeezed today. Well, this is something they had to think about. But they, they set up and they, they thought these things were important. They wanted the children to be educated. Not everyone did, however. Got this lovely little letter which was sent to the Vicar of Berkeley by a local farmer, T. Bailey, in 1882, after the vicar had sent out a letter to parishioners asking for money for a village school. It's rather scribbly there on the side, so I've transcribed it here for you. Dear sir, I received your letter and I'm sorry to inform you, I do not agree with the agricultural labourers' children being kept at school so many years. From my own experience, it makes them very idle. They do not, as a rule, take to work afterwards. I know of arguments for and against over-education. I will give you a few shillings to give away at Christmas to a few deserving old people. I think that will do more good. So that's some really point of view. Didn't like education. Obviously, must have had a run-in with some people who was, and they argued back. But, you know, you had some people taking this view. But to be fair, the vast majority of people really did want to see their children educated. In 1830, the government actually began paying grants to help fund the building of schools. And sort of 30 years later, from 1863, it was extended to help running costs for schools. But to get the funding, schools had to allow government inspections. And, you know, we're still doing this day with Ofsted and everything. And the amount of funding the school received was dependent on some factors. Firstly, pupil attendance. Typically, it was set at four shilling per pupil for regular attendance. They then had a, a figure for pupil performance, um, and this was again set for results. So you had eight shillings per pupil if they passed in reading, writing and arithmetic. Um, the system was ended in 1895 and replaced by a straight grant with no strings attached. They didn't have to worry too much about this anymore, although lots of schools still kept recording these figures. The Elementary Education Act, known as Forster's Education Act, this was legislation that set the framework for the schooling of all children in, between the ages of five and 13 in Eden and Wells. It was a real sort of a turning point, a watershed moment in education. Um, drafted by William Forster, there he is, picture of him there, he's a Liberal MP, introduced on 17th of Feb 1870 after campaign, campaigning by the National Education League. So they'd taken all these concerns of the people and they'd started nationally campaigning, we want education for children, for everybody, not just the rich children. Um, and again, one of the reasons it had a, you know, a fairly sort of stormy-ish passage through Parliament, but a lot of people were saying, well, we do need to do this because we need to remain competitive at the forefront of the world, uh, especially in terms of manufacturing education was the way of seeing us doing it. If we can get our children educated to agree, they'll be make better workers. So we'll be able to rule the world in the empire like we wanted to. So moving on to school records, we've got three main types of records that survive. You have the admission registers, you have the log books and the punishment books. Now, there are some sort of uh, caveat beware on some of these. So the records are subject to access provisions of the Data Protection Act 2018, the Freedom of Information Act 2000 and the Environmental Information Regulations of 2004. So these set some, some uh, sort of conditions for you to view these. Log books, admission registers, less than 100 years old may not be viewed without completing a research undertaken form. Um, punishment books, they're the really serious ones. They are subject access only, so you can only look at them if you think you're one of your ancestors is in there. They are 101. We do have examples of all these later on for, for, in the talk for you to look at. 
So admission registers. Um, they recorded the administrative details of a child in school. Now, they're not the daily attendance registers. These are not generally retained by the archives. In fact, most schools don't retain, retain them for more than a couple of years afterwards. But again, you've got these sitting on top. You've got these admission registers. So they give you a lot of information. So you get that admission number. So usually a running number, admission date, the child's full name, the name of a parent or guardian, the address any religious exemptions, the date of birth, the child's last school, if, if applicable, the date of the child leaving the school, the cause of leaving it, and lastly, you get some remarks. And you can see there, that's a, that's a typical one. These books are fairly, fairly large. They're probably about sort of, you know, a foot to 30 centimetres across per page and quite big. They're usually quite thin, oddly. They didn't keep many numbers in there. They'd rather jump, jump to a new new book. But that's an example. We've got look few more here. So this is zoom in on that one. So you can see here you've got on the on the top top line on the left, you've got sort of the child's uh, admission number. You've got the sort of the date of uh, admission into the school, the name of the child, the name of the guardian, the address. And then you move on to the other page and you've got a date of birth, the name of the last school, if it's Virgin, the date of attendance they left, why they left um, and any remarks on them. And you can see, for example, this top top child here was actually cause of leaving war scholarship. So he was sent to the Tewkesbury High School to continue education. So you can get lots of information if you're doing family history. These are really interesting little things. Example from the Twilling School Register, you do get oddities in them. And you can get an example here with these three at Twill Chilling, named Bergano. Um, you can look at the names here. Obviously, you, you know, these are straight away you sort of think, oh, that's not usual. Johannes, Jacobus, and Josephine. Yeah, okay, Josephine's fairly normal, but the boys' names aren't. And they were staying at Puckrut Farm. Why is this one? If you look across the register on the page, you find in the name of school, it says Belgian refugees from Antwerp. So these are people from the First World War, the refugees from the start of the First World War. We had lots of Belgian refugees coming over and they were found places in schools quite quickly. Very often they did move around a little bit, but initially you do find them. So again, again, a really nice little bit of social history there. So logbooks, um, these are sort of like ship's logbooks, really. They record the day-to-day -day activity at the school. Um, they can be extremely interesting as they often reveal all sorts of odd information. But they do seem, pupil, the heads writing this do seem to be obsessed with pupil attendance, government inspections, religious inspections and the weather. Um, again, for various reasons, we'll find out later. Handwriting can be an issue with some of them. You know, teachers, head teachers can be a bit like sort of vets and doctors. You just can't read the writing. Um, and again, some heads record everything. Some heads record nothing. And we'll look at an example of this a bit later. Um, they were usually logbooks on pro forma, printed with margin lines and page numbers. This is a typical logbook. You can see it basically gives you dates on the left hand side and comments on the right. Um, again, they can be really interesting things. The next slides, again, just a double picture of another page on the, in the same logbook. So you can see the writing on this one is quite good. And we'll pull out a few details of this one later. So what about logbook things? Well, I mentioned earlier on they can be obsessed with things. So let's have a look. So first of all, school examinations. Now here you've got logbook examination of standards one, two and three work fairly good on the whole. Some weak ones. All children interested in the growth of plants and seeds, also in birds and insects and nature, especially queen wasps. So obviously they've had a, a wasp nest in this school and the kids have got really fascinated by it. Um, the standards were the different years. So for one, two, three and fourth year, basically, that's how it worked. Religious inspections. Religious education was actually quite a contentious issue for the 1870 Forster's Education Act. And basically because the nonconformists forced the point that only non-denominational instruction should be given. Because otherwise they viewed, they argued that local ratepayers' money was effectively being spent on the Church of England, even if the local ratepayers were not Church of England or not Church of England goers. So as a result, all state schools were non-denominational. And in practice, they simply taught the basics of the Bible and a few hymns. They stuck to quite a narrow path on that but you'd still get the vicars coming in regularly once a week if not more often you know to inspect the school and then you've got the religious inspectors coming in and if you look at an average school log but you'll see lots of times where visited by a vicar came to visit vicar came to visit and everything sometimes they did a bit of teaching sometimes they didn't 
Uh, logbooks always feature heavily in pupil attendance. And of course, the reason for this was to pay prior to 25, the school's income derived from the number of pupils attending, and therefore more pupils meant more money. It's still pretty much the same today on that. And again, you get a couple of a couple of average ones here coming in. The bottom one, attendance again bad this morning owing to sickness. So, you, so we'll look at this later about how the logbooks can reflect what was happening in villages and, and even towns, areas of towns. So absences, these were disliked, especially unofficial ones. Um, here, here, this one, attendance not quite so good. Children are now and again um, taken to the doctors by parents without being told. We, you know, normally I'd have a note. I like this one. Average attendance, 91 point, 91%. Charlie Orr has been away this week for no reason whatsoever. So you get the feeling that Charlie Orr was a bit of a notorious pupil, a had a habit of not turning up at school. On that note, you've got truancy. So plain truant was fairly common. And if caught, children were punished. But in reality, there was lots of reasons why children didn't attend school, especially so in rural areas where farm help was often required and the, the children were pulled in to do it. Um, some parents, however, were obviously very concerned about often plain truant. And this is an example from Christchurch School in Cheltenham in 1874. And here, the mother of William George actually requested that her son be kept inside at dinner hour to prevent him leaving the school without authorisation. And obviously, the head has made a note about this. He's kept this child in because the, the mother has demanded it, primarily because the, otherwise the pupil would actually just skip school. So you do get some nice, interesting sort of, again, little bits of social history around this sort of thing. However, sometimes heads did face a losing battle. A lovely one from the Gloucester School, one of the Gloucester schools here. Um, the headmasters recorded a rummage sale taking place at the park. Um, obviously, many parents went to this and it caused poor attendance. The children were used uh, by the older children were used to babysitters. And you can see the heads here. Many children away in the afternoon minding baby. So again, you know, the heads can't do anything about this. And obviously the mothers were going to this, this thing, this uh, sale to get clothing and food. So the heads couldn't really do much about it. Holidays, they usually noted down. The larger ones, you can sort of sense a bit of relief in the teachers. Um, they also write down lots of various half days for lots of different reasons. And we'll still see a few examples of this going through in the week. Um, again, it's very, very simple. You know, this one here at the bottom, attendance third week, 87.6%, not many. School was um, granted a half holiday to re prepare the school for the sale of work. So presumably the children have been making things and they were going to sell it maybe to raise money. I don't know, rather like you get cake sales and everything at schools today. Summer holidays um, usually had some sort of celebration. Who enjoyed the most? I don't know. Probably the teachers. And in you go to get this, you know, quite often you get this note. So the top when school closed until September the 19th for harvest holidays. You know, you can expect the headmaster to put yippee on the end of that. Um, you know, closed, school closed. Next example for summer holidays, five weeks. Um, and again, you know, you get this sort of feeling that the teachers did actually look forward to this. Um, and, you know, you had school treats at the bottom one in the park in the afternoon. So, again, it's something to celebrate. And again, I remember it being at school. We used to have like a film show at the end of the whole sort of school year sort of thing. I don't know if that goes on today, but, you know, they still did it when I was a kid. Religious holidays, again, were always taken. Easter at Christmas were the main ones. Um, and again, you get this noted down in the logbooks. Um, again, it's usually not much. You just get one word or two one line entries on it and what they, they, they were was about. Um, you do get special holidays. The most famous one is the Empire Day, which is the celebration of Queen Victoria's birthday on 24th of May. It was renamed Empire Day after a death in 1901. In 19, 1966, it was renamed Commonwealth Day. And it was, again, the date altered a bit, but it was in 1977. It's always the second Monday in March. And this is a typical entry we have. Again, some heads don't record it. This one they do. The writing's a little bit difficult. So here's a, here's a little transcription for you. Empire Day was kept in the afternoon. The rector spoke to the children and prisoners on the empire as one of the steps in God's plan for the union of all peoples through the League of Nations. In Victorian arrogance going through there. Um, the children sang patriotic songs, gave recitations, danced around the maypole, plaiting it in seven ways. And then, I like this one. The head said, this was well done. The way in which the difficulties of varying sizes of children in a small school were got over was excellent. Mrs. Ward was to be congratulated on the success of the celebration. So you can imagine them dance around the maypole, tall kids, little kids, and actually it's working out well. So you wonder how long they had to practice for it. 
Again, here's another one. This is a sort of a more line by line account of it at Empire Day. Um, and it's basically what we did. So they had a hymn, uh, Oh God, our help. Then you had hoisting the flag, saluting the flag. You sang the school song, the first verse of God Save the King. Cheers for the motherhood, which is the unusual aspect of it, I suppose. They had a recitation on Empire Day. Then another song, You Gentlemen of England. Then the head teacher made an address. And then to balance things up, you had Men of Harlech was song. Then the children had to march past the flag and salute it. And then everybody sang, God save the Queen. And every child on leaving got a bun. So, you know, that's probably the best bit of the afternoon, especially if it was a nice one. Armistice Day, um, it's actually mentioned far less than you might expect probably because it was the two minute silence used to be observed at 11 o'clock in the 11th day um whatever weekday it fell on although this has returned to us now we're doing this more often um and this entry comes from a school so when actually the day the guns fell silent and the vicar the the head teacher called the vicar visited the school this morning and arranged for the school to be closed this afternoon on hearing news that the armistice had been signed so this is the armistice probably not the actual day that the guns fell silent it's probably a bit later Weather, it's a great favourite of the logbooks. You get all sorts of weather mentioned, usually the bad weather. Here's an example from Christchurch School. Weather very stormy uh, on the bottom from Orr School. Owing to the heavy snowstorm, the attendance has been very poor all day. The monitress was unable to cope, um, though we... Though through the weather, come through the weather, not cope through the weather, come through the weather. Uh, percentage for the week, 75%. So that dropped probably because, you know, out in the forest, they always catch the snow, even though all's quite low down. Thunderstorms, they often get recorded um, because often school attendance again fell for it. And again, you've got here um, the school, interestingly, was closed on the day before, so on the 9th of January, for a political meeting, which was interesting. Um, some of pupils were ill, but very heavy rain with thunder about half past eight, and the attendance suffered, but not nearly as much as anticipated. So, as you can imagine, the head thinking, oh, God, it's the rain and the thunder coming, we're not going to get any kids, but he got a few. This is a really interesting logbook of Western Sub Edge School records what was probably a notable thunderstorm or a thunderbolt in 1910, which obviously terrified the children. Several fell to the ground. We think they were shocked rather than hit, um, while others ran into the schoolroom. Uh, and you can see here where the, you know, the vicar visited and gave a scripture lesson. Um, the lower division was at drill this afternoon there came a very sudden awful heavy thunderbolt several children fell to the ground others rushed to the schoolroom much tact required to keep them they were so frightened so you can imagine this was quite a terrifying event and you know they, they got, gathered the children inside so you know it would be interesting to find if there's any more information on that but the head doesn't mention it at all Snow and ice, especially in rural areas, seriously affected schools. Um, and again, a couple of examples here. Perfect attendance, attendance notwithstanding a snowstorm. So the pupils all got there. But then you got Friday, a snowstorm in the morning, taking nine, attendance not so good. So again, this sort of thing was, you know, it happens today, a half inch of snow, you know, everything shuts down. Here you're probably thinking of a foot of snow and everything shuts down. And again, again, you see after this comes up, this is from Leighton School. The Tresham children have not come today owing to the roads being covered with ice. So again, ice and snow, snowfalls mentioned. School there at the bottom closed to heavy snow. 17 children at school got through nonetheless. And you wonder what they did with them. Did they keep them or send them home? You also got weather damage. This is a, a lot, one of the logbooks around Amni Cruz's school. Uh, it flooded due to a thunderstorm and a hailstone, hailstorm broke one of the windows. So, you know, there was obviously these things are quite large. And again, that must have been a terrifying event for the children, I think. I mentioned earlier about attendance and rural areas. So farm which so schools actually did frequently let children leave to help agricultural events, usually harvest and haymaking, because they were often very large community events and people in the whole village would come together. Um, and the head here is noted when a boy was excused for haymaking and when he, re he actually returned to school. This is a wartime entry, so it's doubly important then because obviously many of the men had gone to war. So there was not the manpower around. So the older children in schools would be involved for haymaking and harvest. Quick slip. OK, Keith Floyd. Um, this is another really interesting one from Western Sub Edge. This is the attendance is not so good. Several children gone gleaning. Um, and gleaning was basically collecting leftover props from farmers' fields after the harvest. 
It was very common practice in poor areas and was often crucial in getting people, getting families, get them enough food for winter. Um, and they would literally go through the field. The pictures here from actually from Germany and one from a very famous French painting where they're actually going through it and picking up bits of bits of corn and wheat and barley off the field to save it. And they could get quite substantial amounts of this. Um, and again, this is something we've forgotten about how important this this was in actually keeping families going going through the winter time. War work. Um, during World War One, the government's food production department introduced a scheme where only in six counties where schools were invited to collect their pupils, collect hedgerow fruit for money. Um, the fruit was collected, was processed into jam reverse for the forces. And again, you've got the couple of entries here. We've got some more about this in a minute. So a very, very, very bright afternoon. Some children away current picking. That probably isn't war work. That is probably a, a farm work, I think, rather than that. But again, at the bottom, school closed for children to pick blackberries for the Army and Navy. And they also did it on Tuesday afternoon. Another entry here. Um, rural schools had a distinct advantage but city schools did take the park and that we know some were more enthusiastic uh, this is one from the, one of the children girls schools um school had a half holiday each afternoon to blackberry and the girls gathered 144 to 78 pounds and you can see the amounts they were collecting here um, so it's quite important. There is a story I've heard about one of the schools in Cheltenham where two enterprising boys. Now I don't, I've not found this. I don't know whether it's true or false, but I, I believe it's, you know, I believe it is true. Where two enterprising boys, they went out blackberrying, and they only handed in about a quarter of what they picked, and they were found selling the rest down the high street. Now I'd love to find the entry for this. I think it came from the Cheltenham Local History Society. They told me somebody there told me about it. Uh, and you know, you can think, well, there's a couple of entrepreneurs for you. Elon Musk today, they'd be doing the same, I think. So what happened to all this? And when it was say it was all processed, um, and in the County Council Education Committee minutes, we've got actually a summary of what happened and what happened. So it's again, it's a huge amount was, was taken up. So for example, they were, is it, um, 223 schools in Gloucester had taken part and they collected 80, nearly 82 tonnes um, of berries and they've been gathered to the jam factories. There was well, a jam factory at Norton, but others were sent elsewhere. Um, there is also a, at the time there was also a, an idea to pick up conkers. To, they thought there's a process whereby they could turn conkers into explosives. And again, schools collected lots of these, and we've got a couple of entries for those in the logbooks. But that never came to anything. And apparently, for years afterwards, most railway stations had piles of rotting conkers where they detected. But it's interesting. We don't know which schools earned this. But it's just a general amount. So over 30 and under 35 pound have been earned by two schools. I would be surprised if one of them hadn't been the Cheltenham Girls School we had before. But again, and this is quite a good income. But again, it shows you sort of the seriousness which the government has taken the food supply. Um, medical events. Um, schools became vital in helping maintain the health of children and illness and disease obviously could spread very quickly through communities and schools logbooks. They often record this sort of thing uh, and schools could be and were closed by the authorities for health on health reasons. And this lovely picture here of Nurse Wolf about to do her rounds in Goverington uh, in, a, in a donkey cart. So she would probably have come to the school on, on various visits. We start off somebody we probably all remember, Nitty Nora, the knit nurse, used to make regular visits, check the head lice. Uh, you know, you get the children lined up, the nurse would go through you, you know, to, to see what there was. And again, boys would be let, luckier than girls because they had shorter hair. Um, and you get you hear the, this, this nurse is called this morning, examined the heads of the children. 23 were examined and Mary Dunn being the only girl not present. So, you know, why was she wasn't present? Was because she had knits or just sick? Well, we don't know, sadly. School dentist um, obviously struck terror into most people, and it's probably just responsible for giving us people the sort of terror of dentists, the phobias we have. I mean, I still remember a foot driven drill and we're having fillings and God, that was awful. But again, you got this entry. A school dentist visited this afternoon. Several children whose teeth should have been examined were absent through illness. So again, the heads are making notes of this. Uh, they probably wouldn't get caught up again until the following year. <clears throat> Influenza, the annual flu season, far more serious than it is today, could devastate school attendances. 
And this is an example. You look at the attendance for the top 89% to drop to 77% because 12 children away from school suffering from influenza. It got worse. It dropped down to 53%, so 16 children. Um, and then this was actually then reported to the local local authorities. You know, we've got this huge few, few flu outbreak. But again, very important things. Uh, whooping cough, pertussis, uh, bacterial infection of the lungs, uh, highly contagious, spread, easily spread. Name came from its distinctive cough. And again, here you go. You've got an example of the school had three children away with whooping cough. Following Monday, school is closed for three weeks under medical authority. And again, then it gets reopened, but they've still got whooping cough going on. Um, and you can hear the head, hear the head, you see the heads writing here on the bottom. Um, Monday, the 1st of April, it tended slightly better, but many children are away because they whoop. So they've got that cough still. Scarlet fever, uh, it's a streptococcus inf infection. It, that's not really serious today. Um, spread by coughing and sneezing before antibiotic was available. It was a leading cause of death in children. And I've got personal experience of that because I remember my dad telling me when I was a little bit younger that my granddad gave my dad 10 quid for my burial because I caught scarlet fever. And of course, when my granddad was a child, it killed people. So he gave my, you know, my dad, remember, I've got 10 quid for you. You know, this was back in the sort of late uh, mid 60s, I think. So, again, it's, you know, it shows you how serious it was. But again, they are actually looking at this, they're writing it down. So, again, this, these are where logbooks can be really useful because you can find in the communities where you have these sort of diseases and everything. And again, if serious outbreaks occurred of any illness, schools could be closed and disinfected, what we'd call today deep cleaned. And this is an example. The school has today been disinfected by order of the sanitary inspector in accordance with a request made by the chairman of the managers of the school. Chicken pox and measles. Again, today we try and get kids infected, infected with these. So the chicken pox parties you have, you know, back in then you just sent them to school and they picked it up. But again, in nice attendance here, the tents have been very low all the week. 19 out of 24 children are absent with measles because measles is a far more serious one. Diphtheria, um, contagious bacterial infection, affects the nose and the throat, sometimes the skin. Very rare today, but it was once far more common. And it was typically the third leading cause of death for children in England and Wales for, for many years. Um, and this head has noted a case of diphtheria in the parish. Not a school child, but four children are away from the school being excluded. Um, and then the following next day, two children with sore throats asked to remain at home for a time. So again, the they took this really seriously and diphtheria is a particularly horrible disease. Sometimes schools got hit with everything. This is an example of like this one here. Um, epidemics of whooping cough, scarlet fever and influenza. You know, poor, poor school, what's it going to do? It's going to be so many going to be affected with this. 53% attendance, so half of the pupils are away because they're ill. Occasionally you do get deaths recorded. <laughs> Excuse me. And this head is noted here with feelings of regret and recorded the death of Josie Scriven, who was present on October the 4th and left on a pack day and has passed away. The cause of death was blood poisoning. So, you know, this just sounds like it's a septicemia case. No other details, sadly. Um, October 1894. At Barnwood School, Charles Smith collapsed in a fainting fit. <clears throat> Excuse me. The head recorded the whole thing here. So the school, the, the, the child was carried into the school by the head and the mother and the vicar and a doc for, doctor was sent for. But by the time they had arrived, he'd already died, passed away. And, and, and interestingly, they have a half holiday. They didn't just close the school. They had a half holiday. They had to authorise it like that, um, down to a heart attack. So again, very, very sad account. You don't get these too often, has to be said, just occasion. I found about three or four of the records we have. No doubt there are a few more, but. So slog books also record staff changes. <clears throat> Not always in good detail. Um, this is a typical one. Um, May Roberts started work in school today. Particulars, respected Miss Roberts, they give her a name, date of birth. Um, the school, last school she worked out how she was qualified. You have this thing called supplementary teachers where you could sign on as a teacher and you learn through work experience, then, then you could become a teacher. School food. Um, this is school dinner being served at St Michael's Church of England Primary School. 
you can only shudder at what may relieve within that blinking cauldron or pot, can't you? Um, lots of we have we have love hate relationships with our school food, don't we? We all love chocolate crunch and pink custard. We all hated the mashed potato and tapioca. I know I did. Um, but again, this is something really. There's not too many schools doing this day. A lot of the smaller schools don't have school food. So again, this is again it's a nice thing that some of the logbooks and things recorded. You do have special events. Um, this is a nice one. It's been noted in that the school reopened after the summer holidays, but the head said the piano has been taken away during the holidays and there's no mention of its return. So it's just disappeared. So you wonder where it's gone. and Did it ever come back? Because it's never actually mentioned. Distractions. This is I love this one. This again, Boxwell and Later to the School, 1916. The headmistress recorded that an airplane landed in a field nearby. So the children were let out to have a look at it. Of course, 1916, these things were quite rare, been highly unusual. Um it became more common in later to 1918 because the Australian Flying Corps had a base. So there must have been aircraft flying all over the place. So that just wouldn't have happened. And this is a nice, I like to contrast with them with Wencombe School. Um, in 1916, the Royal Flying Corps actually opened an airfield at Wencombe. The end of the runway <clears throat> was literally right above the school because the school's on a little scarp. Headmaster there never once mentioned an airplane or an aerodrome or even the war. And, you know, and the kids must have been dying to look at these aircraft flying over their head, especially because um, one of the famous VCs actually led one of the strong squadrons there. So he would have been a local hero, a bit like Lord Flasher on the cigarette cards. But his headmaster steadfastly refuses to mention anything. Doesn't make sense. Um, small boys and steam trains at uh, Christchurch School in Cheltenham. Um, you see a map of it there. It was sat on the bridge over the we're lining to St. James's Station. And the, the headmaster often notes down incidents with trains. So here in this one on the fifth, forbade the boys getting onto the railway bridge and the walls because obviously small boys, grown boys would want to see the steam trains go by. And then had to punish three boys for getting on the bridge and for staying in the playground after. Oh, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat after the school in the afternoon again presumably they are watching the school the scheme trains and you can see by the school there the actual playground ran right up to the edge of the cutting where the trains were going in um get other interesting events you know this 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 school here a very unpleasant day owing to the flu of the stove being choked and the room is full of smoke so that must have been a horrible day at school but the blacksmith came in the in the evening and actually set right to it so again it only lasted for a couple of days but still you wonder if they were outside most of the time although again march the hats have the fire lit it must have been cold and snowy outside on fire night that gets an occasional mention not very often and on this one you've got a whole whole sort of instance about what's happening but there at the very bottom um you can see mrs mrs fred cripps visited and brought a large parcel of fireworks these were let off this evening at six o'clock so again after school but you know this is even 1911 you wonder what sort of fireworks these these were it must have been great fun for the children um moving on to punishment the, the Name the corporal punishment name derives from Latin body corpus. Typically, the flexible ratting cane was either applied to the students' hands or, in the case of boys, to the backside to see the trousers. Um, state run schools, it was banned, outlawed in 1986. In private schools, banned in 1999, 2000, 2003, in the other countries. Um, an alternative to actually corporal punishment was shaming which again is, is a nasty thing really and you can see this entering this logbook uh, at the bottom seven boys shamed before the school for playing with fire last evening in the village street you know so this would involve them being brought out in front of the school and literally humiliated um you know it's this you, you tend to link this nowadays with sort of gym teachers and you know games teachers you know making people run around or making you stand in front of everybody else saying you know this boy can't run but you know this was a, this was a, a way they did it and again it's not very nice but probably not as bad as actually being punished so the in 1907 there's the education administrative procedures act it set up a number of systems for schools and among them what they related to the health of the children and every school had to by law have a punishment book in which all cases of corporal punishment were recorded so it happened quite early and we've got a few of these examples the ones you're going to look at are all sort of allowed to be viewed because they're all older than the, the um, laws allow 
So you get typically very much like the admission register. You get a day, but the depth, all pro forma, name of the scholar, what class they are in, nature of the offence, the punishment, and who administered, administered the punishment. So example, this one, at the top of the there, you've got two of the six, Bolton, Fred, disobedience, two strikes of the cane administered by ACB. Probably the head of the school, that's usually where it was. And you get a, a, a sort of bottle gets it again, disobedience again down there on the 2nd of March. Um, and, you know, is you get lots of, you often you get the same kids appearing time and time again. And you get Violet Herkham here striking a child in the playground, a slap on the arm with a hand, you know, and again, disobedience, Mick W. Walker punching, etc. So you get quite a few of these. And the ones you can look at, some of the offences are minor, others are more serious. Um, this is another one. So you get disobedience, defiance, eating apples in school against orders. You know, apples are healthy, yet the kids aren't allowed to eat it. You know, two strokes of the crane to these two boys. And disobedience, laziness, you know, um, having obscene language in the playground. But again, disobedience, disobedience, even impudence. Teachers hate impudence. Um, you know, but again, here's the name, here's the things they got. Four strikes, six strikes. So the obviously headmasters presumably get fed up with some of these boys. This is a different school. Um, this is <laughs> sorry for Ernest Hitter here and James Hyatt. Um, came to school one hour late. Sheep driving without parents' consent. What? <laughs> yeah, do they just go into the field and drive sheep out, or are they trying to put street sheep away? We don't know. It's not mentioned. And then you got Edgington here, made a noise, was asked to come and say why he did it, did nothing but yell loudly. And um, this teacher actually, you know, strokes on the buttocks and one on each hand. And the one at the bottom I quite like here is James Hyatt. Again, James Hyatt, you're getting into trouble, mate. Why? Um, knocked an apple out of a boy's hand and started to eat the same. Briefly a case of theft. <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's not too many of these we can look at. You know, thankfully, this has gone by by now. Um, but I think this is a one more to go. Um, John William Prattley. The head has obviously lost all patience with this boy, using disgusting language and throwing mud over the two mistresses outside school on several occasions after repeated warnings. And he's written there on the side, a thoroughly bad boy in every sense, almost hopeless, not fit to associate with other children. So again, you can see this kid must have cropped up again and again and again, and the headmaster had just had enough of it. What can he do? But notice he hasn't said totally hopeless almost hopeless so he's still a glimmer of hope he can turn this boy around so that brings us to the end of the talk i hope you enjoyed it um we're happy to try and take some questions if you have any via the teams a couple of reminders firstly um if we don't get time to answer a question, you can always email it to us at the archives at gloucestershire.gov.uk. We'll try our best to answer it. And also, we ask you if you could sort of complete the evaluation forms that you've got with your booking, because they do really help us plan. You know, and if you have any ideas for things you'd like to know about in future talks, you know, let us know. You know, we make these up off the top of our heads what to do. But, you know, if you want to have some input, brilliant. A couple of reminders again, our next Saturday event is this coming Saturday, 1st of April. Um, it's a sister event to this, it's Milk Bottles and Conquer. So it's a focus on education and school days. We've got talks on Gloucester schools before 1800. The best of days, which is uh, how do we record our childhood school memories? We've all got them, you know, how best to keep them, how best to look after them. We've got a document display on King's Own School. Plus we've got behind, behind the scenes tours of the archives, which of course was the old King's Own School. We've also got uh, a little stand on the the art of penmanship, how good you're writing, and the Gloucestershire Family History Society, as usual, are on hand to help you with any sort of family history queries, especially relating to schools, but you know, elsewise. We do ask now that because the space is limited for the talks, we're asking you to book if you can via the website there, www.heritagehub.org.uk slash events, um, only because we are limited in the number we actually sit for the talks. If you don't want to come to talks, but you want to have a look at everything else, you don't need to book. And finally, I'll just let you know that our next Secrets Revealed online talk will be on the 26th of April, and it's a special one. It's Treasures from the Archives. It's going to be a look at some of our favourite documents, the ones we like, the ones we know we would rescue in case of a fire, that sort of thing. And again, there's some lovely images in this, so uh, it's well worth attending. So thank you very much, and I'll just hand back to you, Kate, now. Thank you, John. And I don't often get to hear your talks nowadays, so that was an absolute treat for me. I forgot something. Oh, go on. I 
Uh, this is, you're going to be embarrassed. That. I'd just like to say to everybody, in our oh, midst, no. we have the mother of an <laughs> Oscar winner. So Kate's son, Tom, was the director and writer of An Irish Goodbye, which won Oscars for the best short film at the Oscar ceremony. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's one of the funniest, sweetest things you'll ever watch. It's currently on BBC iPlayer. So a little plug for Kate son, Tom, there. He's a thoroughly good bloke. So there you go, Kate. Back to you oh. again. Thank you, John. Was not expecting that. Well, now you've plugged, I'll, I'll plug it even more because if, if anybody wanted to see it on a big screen, which is how it was really sort of intended to be seen, there's a screening at uh, Gloucester Guildhall on Sunday afternoon and then one at Tivoli Cinema at Cheltenham Monday evening and one in Tivoli Cinema in Bath on Monday evening as well. So thank you. Thank you for that unexpected turn of events. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that talk, John. I, I was interested with that uh, will in the 18th century that um, bequeathed money for 10 boys and 10 girls, which I was surprised mm. about the girls. I thought that was quite enlightened, actually. And it was the same number, wasn't it? Yeah, that and is. Yeah, and it's... A you know, again, that's something you sometimes find it. They were quite equal about this. So they wanted the girls to get into education. The trouble is you do wonder what happened to the girls afterwards. They were probably just became, you know, mums and, you know, daughters on farms and things, you know, but you never know. Some may have gone on for more, but it's interesting. They do often stipulate it's for both sexes, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, now, I hope I haven't missed any questions. Um, I can't actually see any in the chat. I, I can see that um, Alison's just left a comment. So she said, um, my father, now in his 80s, used to collect rose hips and sell them to Boots to make rose hip <laughs> syrup, which is really interesting, isn't yeah. it? Um, picks good. up on what you were saying about the importance of all this sort of gathering of, of fruit and um, sort of produce. Yeah, it'd be interesting. So in his 80s, so yeah, I suppose he's a bit later than World War One, isn't he? But I mean, I guess it's something they still do. I know Boots used to buy things in the chemists. Lots of chemists would take in produce from for the hedgerows, basically. So yeah, really interesting. Okay. Um, I can't see any more questions. I just hope I'm not missing them because I'm not not brilliant at the at the tech. But I think Amy Amy will draw it to my attention if I am. Right, Amy's just posted in the chat um, to say that the this session, the recording of it, will be on our Heritage Hub YouTube channel shortly. And I think she posted. Um, yeah, she posted up the booking details for the link Brilliant. to our website if people want to book onto our upcoming Saturday event, which John mentioned, which again, it just explores the education theme a bit further. Excellent. So I think that's <laughs> it. I, th I think it's a wrap, John, as we say. It's a wrap, as I say. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Tom. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, and I hope that some of you will, well, all of you will sort of come, come back in next month. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.